welcome everybody to the virtual tour of the Saskatchewan Structural Sciences Centre. We are located at the University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon, Canada. My name is Jason Maley and I've been a research officer here in the centre for over 18 years. And today I will be your tour guide. Our centre is located in the historic Thorvaldson building on the University of Saskatchewan campus. It was one of the first buildings built on campus over 100 years ago. At this time, I would also like to acknowledge that our center and the university are on Treaty 6 First Nations land and the homeland of the Métis. The university campus is very diverse. In addition to your typical university colleges, the University of Saskatchewan also has a medical, dentistry and a veterinary medicine colleges on campus. In addition, there are several federal research labs as well as national research facilities such as the Canadian Light Source, Canada's only synchrotron. We also have some pretty cool wildlife. This beaver and its family live in a ravine that is only about a two minute walk from our building. The SSSC is a centralized core instrument research center that is available for the USASC research community. The center was created through the funding of a CFI instrument grant way back in 1999. After building renovations, we were finally able to move all of our equipment into one central location in 2003. To date, we have approximately $18 million worth of instruments and it is growing. And also, some of those original instruments funded way back in 1999 are still working to this day. In terms of university hierarchy, the SSSC is an independent unit under the Office of Vice President Research. We have no college or department affiliation. One of our core principles here at the Centre is that every research group has equal access to instrumentation and lack of research funds are not restrictive. We simply ask our research groups to pay what they can for instrument fees. The SSSC staff train students and researchers on the instruments. They also help assist with experimental design and data analysis. One of our signature strengths is that we can train researchers on equipment and help them apply the techniques to what would be considered non-traditional research areas with respects to the instrument technique. We have approximately 60 research groups and about 150 students and graduate students, HQPs, from across campus that use the SSSC facility on an annual basis. The SSSC instrumentation is also available to researchers from other academic institutions and industry. Our services can range from simple fee-for-service for sample measurements to academic collaborations. For example, one of our first archaeological research projects started with a curious dentistry professor who explored dinosaur teeth in his spare time. He then put us in contact with Dr. Don Brinkman, who was the Director of Preservation and Research from the Royal Terrell Museum in Drumheller, Alberta. We then joined up with Dr. Renfei Feng, beamline scientist for the Vespers beamline at the Canadian Light Source, and we studied some ancient dinosaur teeth. More recently, we have actively worked with the Mercator Florin Group from the University of Calgary since 2016. Some of our ongoing collaborative projects include the chemical measurements on ancient start samples, uh, dental calculus sample analysis, as well as some studies on measuring some modern starch degradation products. The SSSC instrumentation consists of many instruments that are used across a large number of research fields. These research fields range from the health and life sciences to the physical sciences, agriculture, and engineering. I encourage you to visit our website located at the bottom right of this slide for more information. 
In addition to the instrumentation located within the SSSC, we also have access to instruments located in other areas of the university. This includes access to the Western College of Veterinary Medicine imaging facility where they have both SEM and TEM capabilities. And we also have access to equipment located within engineering research labs. NMR spectroscopy is a non-destructive technique that measures the nuclei such as protons, carbon-13, and their chemical shifts due to the, their environment and neighboring nuclei. Our NMR lab contains three 500 megahertz and one 600 megahertz NMR spectrometers. The 500 and 600 megahertz represents the electromagnetic frequency, which are radio waves, that is used to measure the energy of the nuclear spin transitions. The large features that you see there in the background are the superconducting cryomagnets. They are surrounded by liquid helium and liquid nitrogen in order to keep their magnetic coil in a superconducting state. One of the main applications of this technique is determining the chemical structures of products from synthetic reactions. Here the Organic chemists need to generate several milligrams of material in order to generate good NMR spectra. Solid state NMR measurements typically use about 100 milligrams of material. We had used this technique with the Mercator Fluorine group in order to identify different types of silicon and aluminum mineralization products in some dental calculus samples. Mass spectrometry is a technique that is used to determine the exact masses of samples. In this technique, molecules are ionized by an external source, usually it's an electron beam, and the resulting molecular fragments are sorted and separated in a magnetic field, and the fragments are detected according to their mass charge ratio. The analysis of the molecule's fragments are also useful in determining the potential structure of the molecule. We currently have three mass spectrometers in the SSSC. The first one is a quadrupole time of flight LC-MS-MS mass spectrometer with an electron spray ionization source. We can inject purified compounds by direct infusion or through the HPLC. This technique is typically used to determine the exact mass measurement of molecules. We have a Another similar model mass spectrometer, except it is operating in MALDI mode. MALDI stands for Matrix Assisted Laser Desorption Ionization. It is primarily used for larger molecules like proteins and polymers that have molecular weights up to 40 kilodaltons. We also have a gas chromatography time of flight mass spectrometer. It is interfaced to a GC with an auto sampler. We have used this instrument to study the volatile thermal degradation products from modern starch samples. In this experiment, we use SPEMI fibers, which are a coated fiber, and they absorb volatile molecules, and then we can inject these fibers into the GC MS for analysis. X-ray diffraction is a non-destructive technique that provides detailed information about the crystallographic structure and chemical composition of crystalline materials. This technique uses an X-ray source which is focused onto a crystalline sample. The crystal structure causes the X-ray beams to elastically scatter or diffract in many directions. By measuring the angles and intensities of these diffracted beams, a 3D structure can be deduced for the molecule. The SSSC has a single crystal X-ray diffractometer which is used to determine the atomic structure of small molecules. And we also have a powder X-ray diffractometer. This instrument is used to identify unknown crystal materials such as minerals and inorganic compounds. It can also be used to determine the percent crystallinity, crystal size, as well as any crystal strain and stress in the materials. 
X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy is a non-destructive, surface-sensitive technique used to probe the electronic properties of materials. This type of measurement is done under ultra-high vacuum conditions, which are in the order of 10 to the minus 8 to 10 to the minus 9 torr, and the measurements are done within the first 10 nanometers of a surface. So it is truly a surface-sensitive technique. Chemical elements can be identified by their specific binding energies and the relative percentages of these elements can be quantified from the XPS spectrum. We have used this technique to identify and quantify different elements that were present in dental calculus samples. I would like to switch gears now and spend a little bit more time and introduce you to vibrational spectroscopy and in particular Raman spectroscopy. Both Raman and infrared spectroscopies are vibrational spectroscopy techniques and complementary to each other. Every molecule will have a specific number of vibrational modes. For example, linear shaped molecules like carbon dioxide will have 3n-5 vibrational modes where n represents the number of atoms in the molecule. For nonlinear molecules such as water or H2O, there will be 3n minus 6 vibrations. Infrared and Raman vibrations occur due to different properties of a chemical bond. Infrared active vibrations arise from a change in the dipole moment on a chemical bond. In term of, terms of dipole moments, recall the electronegativity trends in the periodic table. We know, for example, that oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen, so the dipole moment on an OH bond will be towards the oxygen atom. On the other hand, Raman spectroscopy vibrations arise from changes in the polarizability of the chemical bond. The polarizability is the charge distribution or the electron cloud around the bond. In many cases, molecular vibrations are both Raman and IR active, with the intensity being greater in one of the techniques compared to the other. In rare instances where molecules have a center of inversion, specific vibrations in these molecules will be specifically IR active or Raman active, but not both. So I just wanted to show this image very quickly. This image relates the different types of chemical bonds and the different types of stretches and bends in relation to where they would be located in a typical vibrational spectrum. So we know, for example, that bonds with lighter atoms will occur, their stretching vibrations will occur in the higher wave number regions. For example, the CH um, for alkanes occurs around 2850 to 3000 wave number, and NH stretches in amines and amides will occur somewhere around 3300 wave number. We can also look at the say 1600 to 1750, 1800 spectral region. And this is where you typically see the carbonyl, which is a C double bonded O stretch. And so this will occur for uh, functional groups that include esters, carboxylic acids, aldehydes. So all of those will happen in that spectral region. So there are many handbooks and tables available for vibrational spectroscopy analysis for all sorts of chemicals and minerals. So now I'm going to move on and give a quick illustration on how the Raman microscope works inside. And so we use these high powered lasers and the laser is guided towards the sample through a series of mirrors. At the sample, the laser light is going to scatter. 
The majority of this scattering will be what's called Raleigh scattering, which is elastic. So the energy in equals energy out. However, there are a small amount of photons, and it's about 1 in 10 million, that will interact with the sample. And if it loses energy, it'll be redshifted, and that's called Stokes scattering. And then there's even less amount that will gain energy when it interacts with the sample, and that would be blue shifted, and that's what we call anti-stokes. Now the intensity of the stokes scattering is much higher than the anti-stokes scattering, so we are just gonna concentrate on the stokes scattering. So this is all backscattered to a set of filters. At the filters, it will reject the Raleigh scattered light and it will allow the Stokes scattered light through towards the detector. Now I should also mention that with samples that have some kind of fluorescence, fluorescence is also a red shifted event and that will also pass through to the detector. And so it moves off to a grating where it diffracts and it can be rotated and selected the different wavelengths, which is then guided towards the detector, which produces the electrical signal and gives us an intensity and our Raman spectrum. So one of the more fundamental questions that's often asked is which vibrational technique should I use? And the answer will be normally dictated by the type of samples that you're researching. For example, with FTIR spectroscopy, it is a very well suited technique for identifying functional groups of organic materials. This is a standard technique for synthetic chemists in order to characterize their synthetic products to verify the types of functional groups present in it. Fluorescence is not a problem in this technique and because we are using an infrared source for excitation, the conventional instruments can measure down to about a 10 micron spot size. If we go to synchrotron radiation, the FTIR measurements can go to smaller spot sizes. One of the late major limitations in FTIR spectroscopy is water contamination. Water has a very large absorption and it normally will contaminate the spectrum. Instrument detectors also have a limited range. So for example, a mid-IR instrument, which is typically used for the functional groups, can, co can collect from 6,000 to about 400 wave numbers. So if you have any metal bonds, these things typically show up below 400 wave numbers and you would have to use a far IR instrument. So on the other hand, for Raman spectroscopy, this technique is actually uses a light scattering process in which high powered lasers are focused onto the samples. So we really can't call this a non-destructive technique because depending on the types of samples that are being measured too much laser power can actually burn the samples. It is an excellent technique to characterize different types of carbon materials and allotropes and it is also very excellent to measure different types of metal oxides. Raman spectroscopy can also be used to look at the different types of polymorphism in um, polymorph materials like silicon dioxide. The peak width can provide information regarding the crystallinity of the material and it is also possible to measure the lattice vibrations of crystals with Raman spectroscopy. And from these types of measurements one can deduce any types of crystal strain or, or stress strain in, in the lattice due to different, say, deposition 
processes or crystal doping. In addition, with a confocal microscope, a Raman microscope, it is also possible to embed, measure embedded materials. With Raman spectroscopy, water is not a problem, and so this technique can be used to measure live cells, for example. However, one of the significant limitations for Raman spectroscopy is that it is very sensitive to sample fluorescence. So the sample fluorescence may be magnified due to the use of the high-powered lasers. And the fluorescence coming off the, uh, the material can swamp out the Raman signal. Typically, we can use different laser wavelength excitations to try and move away from the sample fluorescence. One of the newer techniques available, and we just recently have some of these in our center, is actually called time-gated Raman spectroscopy. And in this case, they're using pulsed lasers and fast detectors in order to separate the fluorescence and the Raman signal coming from samples. Sensitivity is also an issue with Raman spectroscopy because it is, of course, after all, a light scattering process. In some cases, the Raman spectrum can be enhanced by several orders of magnitude using SIRS substrates. So SIRS stands for Surface Enhanced Raman Scattering, and these types of substrates are usually composed of gold or silver nanoparticle or nanoplates. So I just wanted to quickly show you an example of what Raman microscopy can, can provide. In this example here, I was able to image a single aluminum oxide grain which had an approximate um, size of just under 20 microns. And in this case, we were measuring different types of metal oxides present on, on the surface. So in this case, you can see on the right, we have different um, characteristic spectra of three different types of molyoxide, molybdenum oxides. And so there's an alpha nickel moly, the polymeric, and a moly trioxide. And we can see from the different images here that you can observe different types of hot spots, and so those would be concentrated regions in which the different types of um, metal oxide are present. So in this case, with this mapping, I was using a 100 times objective, and so each pixel is only 600 nanometer pixel size. So in general, sample preparation for Raman spectroscopy is normally quite simple. Um, samples can be in a powder, particle, liquid form, and really, if we can fit it under the microscope and focus the objective onto the sample, we can obtain a Raman spectrum. Now, one of the things that may, may happen here is the, the uh, sample substrate, or what we hold it with, um, may be an issue depending on which type of laser excitation we use. So, for example, when we use glass, a simple glass slide, that's very suitable for a green 514 laser excitation. However, if one uses a 785 or move into the more red region for laser excitation, you get a very large background fluorescence from the glass substrate. And so normally we will use something like, for example, what I have here is a, a gold covered silicon and in this case, I am depositing a small amount of barley starch onto this sample. And so in this case, I simply um, made the starch powder into um, a solution with methanol. And then I just simply deposit it and you allow the, the solvent to evaporate. So the gold here is not that significant. It's only about 100 nanometers um, 
thickness so you won't get rich off using uh, this type of uh, sample. So I'd like to show you now how we go about and acquire a typical Raman spectrum. Before I start this video here, I just want to point out that with our Raman microscope here, this little top part is actually a, an FTIR attachment. And so this is the only microscope system in Canada that can obtain both the Raman and the FTIR in the same region. And so here I had just taken that uh, sample that we previously prepared with the barley starch onto the gold uh, substrate. Just close the lid. And so right now we're just with a five times magnification and we can see sort of black spots here that are representative of the different starch granules. Okay. And we can simply click on the uh, image to move the microscope stage. So now it's the 20 times magnification and now we can start to see a little more detailed on individual starch granules. So again, I can center the crosshairs. That's where the laser is going to show up. And finally, here's a 50 times magnification. And so we can see that our starch granules are roughly about 20 microns or so. And so there's just a little quick image of the laser. In this case, we're starting with the 514 laser excitation. And so we'll just have to bear with this, this video and, and as it progresses here. And so here we are scanning. We start from the lower wave numbers and move up to the high. And we can see the first peak here shows up roughly around 480 and this is really characteristic of starches. Uh, this is a uh, symmetric stretch of the glucose ring. And here at the very end we can see the very large peak at around 2900 which is representative of the CH's stretching. And so now it's completed. We can take a look and we can see that our sample doesn't show any visible signs of burning so that's a good thing. So now I've just switched it over to um, run the 785 laser excitation and so we can see that the the spectrum is a little bit different. We don't see a large background so there's much less fluorescence with the 785 and again we will just run through so here it is nearly completed and it does look a little bit different than the 514 collection. Here it's completed. We don't see any burning. And so finally, here's just a quick overlay. So with the red one, this represents the um, 514 laser excitation. You can notice that the CH stretches are much more intense with this laser compared to the 785. And this is just indicative of the um, the different lasers. The, uh, the intensity of peaks are, are uh, related to the laser energy and so higher energy um, lasers will produce um, higher intensity uh, peaks. So what I had shown you today is roughly how I've approached um, measuring ancient start samples with the Mercator Florin group. Um, 
at this time I've sort of run out of time for today so I can't really go into more discussion about the time gated ramen but we'll maybe save that for another day. Um, to conclude we are open to discussing the application of our instruments to your research projects. Um, you can contact our SSSC manager Dr. Ramaswamy Saminakan and thank you for your attention.